Pearl. Um, I am the Loric Project Manager here at Bishop Grotesque University. Um, for those of you that don't know, the university is based in Lincoln, which is in the East Midlands. Um, so it's, it's a, a city surrounded really by very rural areas. Um, we've got two universities in the city. We've got the uh, University of Lincoln, which is our, our, our bigger, uh, younger neighbour down the hill. And then we are the old um 160 years old um, organization which is in the uphill area of Lincoln and um, we specialize a lot in teacher training and more service um, public service related um, or, um, courses uh, and specialisms so I just want to talk today about the work that I'm involved in um, between the LORIC, which is the Lincolnshire Open Research Innovation Centre, and also the wider social economy work that's being done through Bishop Grotes University. So just to begin with, um, it's, it sort of falls into three different aspects here um, within BGU. We have our BGU Social Economy Hub, which is a space um, uh, for uh, organisations to be based, uh, office rental, etc. Um, we have the Greater Lincolnshire Social Economy Academy, uh, which I'll explain more thoroughly, and then the Lincolnshire Open Research Innovation Centre, which is my department. So um, I'll just, just talk you through how we kind of came to be involved quite so heavily in the social social economy. Um, just a note at this point, we do tend to use the terminology social economy um, to, and social economy organisations rather than social enterprise. Um, because it's a wider definition and depending on your definition it can include things like charities, unincorporated groups, community groups, those types of things. So it's kind of a much broader description and definition of the types of people that we work with. So it all started off really uh, just pre-COVID really. Um, we had a social economy steering group which was founded in 2019 uh, which I was a member of and, and was headed by um, our director for external engagement here at the university um, through we, we both come from a, a, a public sector background and, and have worked in that sort of arena for, for a lot of years um, so one of the things that came from the steering group was actually it would be great if we could understand the social economy of the area so that led into a quite a large piece of research being done by myself and um, professor nigel curry um, who at the time was linked to the university of lincoln to look at the different types of social economy organisations and then also to map the sector within Greater Lincolnshire. Um, so we have a little challenge geographically in that we, we fall across Lincolnshire, the, um, the local authority area of Lincolnshire, but we also take in the local, uh, like more district based of North and North East Lincolnshire, but they actually as a region fall under um, Humberside. So we're a little split um, so a lot of the research that was done at the time did need to take into account sort of three different lots of, of, of looking at different uh, different organisations for the different geographies. Um, so that work was done. That involved, as I say, mapping the sector in terms of finding out exactly how many charities we could find that were registered, how many community land trusts, how many CICs, um, etc., um, how many mutuals, cooperatives. Um, that led us to create some qualitative research as part of this project where we spoke to social economy organizations around um, what their experiences were of the sector all of which fed into a report which we published in 2020 um, which then in turn led into creating a social economy strategy um, really for the area but more loosely based around a steering group um, so that strategy was put in place and we are currently in the process of revisiting the, the mapping research that was done previously to update now in a post COVID world, how many, you know, how many charities do we have now? How many CICs? And I must say the, the data available on all of that has improved so much within the last sort of three, four years. It's, it's, it's made the may work a lot, lot easier. So the research that we did led into a social economy strategy for, for Lincolnshire and, and Greater Lincolnshire. Um, main aspects of that included sort of cultural change around identity, which is where we chose to go very much with the social economy organisation sort of definitions. Um, around the principles of the sector, that they were ethical, place-based, community-led. Um, 
looking at administration, particularly around kind of leadership, using evidence-based practice, social value and forming partnerships, information and persuasion around education and campaigns to educate people around what is the social um, economy, how does it work, what does it do, um, and then to sort of support uh, support that. Um, we discussed financial incentives, whether it would be possible to develop funds for the social economy sector locally. Um, and at the time we were looking at support relief packages because we were in the midst of COVID. And then one of the things was to look at action projects. So planning um, specific pieces of research. So again, sort of the, the revisit piece of work that we're doing at the moment, um, influencing procurement, developing customer markets, support networks and developing places. So just from that, just show some of the progress that's been made off the back of the, the research and the strategy that was put in place. So Bishop Grotes University have since signed up to the Lincoln Social Responsibility Charter. So we're now members of that. We've launched the BG Futures Social Economy Hub. BG Futures as a department within the university already existed very much as a business incubator space. But due to the research that we did in the strategy, we um, requested permission from the original funders to change the covenants on the building in order for us to be able to change the purpose of it to be more of a social economy hub. So now, whilst there are a couple of offices available for startups, the majority of the spaces available and support available is for social economy organisations. And it is actually, um, it will be full in a couple of weeks time. We're just waiting on our final tenants to be moving in. Um, We've also become supporting members of Social Enterprise UK, who spoke in the first session um, of, of this community practice. And the university has also played a leading role in preparing for the application for Greater Lincolnshire to be recognised as a social enterprise place. Again, sort of heading up that steering group um, and, and taking consultation from local organisations to create the application form for that. And that's well underway and will be submitted quite soon. So just briefly in terms of the hub and the facilities that we offer. So we've got our social economy hub. There's a couple of nice pictures of it here. Um, so self-contained offices, typical kind of um, business office rental spaces um, available mostly to charities, cooperatives, community groups and other social economy businesses. And we have got virtual tenancies available as well um, through the uh, through the offer and included in that in includes um, networking opportunities, obviously referrals around different um, support organisations and, and ecosystems as well. Off the back of the research and the strategy, we also had the Greater Lincolnshire Social Economy Academy, um, initially funded via Lincolnshire County Council. Um, and launched in 2021, we offered a range of training and development opportunities um, for organisations through face to face and online workshops and support. Um, one of the workshops series that was offered was around social economy debates, which were highlighted within the original strategy as well. So bringing further people together to discuss the strategy and, and the ways forward, which has then helped to inform the social um, enterprise place application. So we've recently been successful um, from the UK SPF, so the Shared Prosperity Fund, to deliver activities as part of the Greater Lincolnshire Social Economy Academy until March 2025. So funded by UK government and supported by Lincolnshire County Council and Business Lincolnshire. So that will form a series of workshops and some one-to-one -one support for a range of social economy organisations and entrepreneurs so potentially students or other social entrepreneurs that haven't yet set up in business, we can do some pre-startup support for those as well. Um, so that's launching on Monday and will be in place until 2025 under the current round of funding. And then on to the Lincolnshire Open Research Innovation Centre, which is my department. So this department was established in 2017 with ERDF funding um, on the um, Priority One Innovative uh, Innovation Axis. So it was developed as a research centre and event space to help organisations to understand, use and share data um, with a view to helping them to grow and develop. So we are um, the only off-campus building, actually. We are a fantastic old Victorian um, ex-children's home um, off, off the main campus, but still within close vicinity to the campus um, set up as a business centre 
again, due to various covenants, et cetera, on the building and how it was originally funded, we've been able to request permissions now that we can use that as rental office space for businesses that are involved in research, development and innovation. So that's in its very early days at the moment. Um, so initially, this project was funded through ERDF, um, which helped to buy, renovate and kit out the building and to run a business support project for local businesses. We then had a period where we weren't funded by ERDF and then we began again on our LORIC 2.0 project, which was funded by ERDF, which repeated the business support offer, which was around helping SMEs to get involved in research and development to help them to grow their businesses, develop new products and services, um, take on new employees um, and engage with researchers. So just to briefly talk about the funding model, because that might be of interest um, for people looking at, at the, the platform that we've got here. So originally, the, the LORIC did start off as a, a part funded by ERDF and BGU. Um, then we moved into what we call our LORIC legacy phase, so the legacy of the LORIC project, where we did access funding through UKRI. Um, through our uh, typical university allocations of that funding. And then we also operated commercially. So we did a commercial contract with DEFRA um, uh, jointly with another local organization and other um, sort of smaller base projects tending to be with um, public sector organizations. Um, then from 2020 onwards, um, we had the LORIC 2.0 funding in place. So we had a very much a hybrid funding model in place for that. So the, the LORIC 2.0 project was funded by ERDF and BGU. Um, but then anything that we did as a department that fell outside of that was funded by UKRI, um, mo more specifically the policy support fund um, and then commercial operation. So it was tendering for contracts and um, being awarded contracts by um, organisations, again, typically local um, public sector organisations, local authorities, um, and one of the big contracts that we had was with Lincoln City Council, which was to look at analysing census data for the city um, over all of the census topics, which would then in help, help them to inform their um, strategy going forward over their next 10-year plan. So, so kind of moving forward um, in terms of how we're funded and, and how we're operating, so we do have access still to UKRI funding. Um, we either have or are in the process of engaging in contracts with private sector, um, social economy sector organisations and public sector organisations. And the Shared Prosperity Fund on the right there, where there is a question mark, I can say from this week, we have actually been successful in um, a Shared Prosperity Fund for the LORIC department to um, reprise some of the business support offer that we had. Um, previously and we are waiting on a second one which hopefully might come through later today. So the types of research that we've been involved in have included project evaluation, social impact evaluation, um, open database research projects as I mentioned, community-based research and sector mapping such as the social economy sector mapping that we did initially and then are now revisiting. So that's a bit of a whistle-stop tour. Hopefully that puts me in time um, for a couple of questions. So I'm going to stop sharing now, if that's okay. Um, and it's done. That was fantastic. Nope. Thanks so much, Kay. That was a really uh, insightful uh, run through uh, the work that's going on there. We've got a couple of questions, so I might shout those out um, and give a minute or two for any more to come through. It, it seems to focus on funding uh, a couple of questions about do either sort of tenancies of any of these organisations bring income uh, and then what would be the split of different sort of inc um, support for it that it's existed so far? So, so in terms of the hub and the funding for tenants, tenants pay that at commercial rates. Um, it's available to social economy organisations, but it is, it is a commercial operation. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. So we don't have any subsidised funding to, um, to to keep that building running. That that runs off off commercial income. Um, the proportional split of cost between BGU, ERDF, and UKRI. 
initially when we first had the project it was a 60 40 split with ERDF paying 60 percent and uh, Bishop Grotes University paying 40 percent under the LORIC 2.0 project was a little more complex as you could see so we had the the, the ERDF project which is the LORIC 2.0 project was again 60 40 split so 60 percent ERDF 40 percent Bishop Grow test. However, we set up our operations for the longevity of that project so that that accounted for 80% of our work, allowing us a further 20% the way we could engage in other work, which then it took in the UKRI contracts and any commercial contracts. So proportionally, roughly around half um, probably ended up being ERDF funded. Um, but only for the elements of that we did as part of that project. So it, it was a bit of a more of a complex picture. So I, hopefully that answers that question. Great, thanks so much. Um, I guess one last question I've got, uh, maybe is the last couple come into the chat. Um, yeah, there's one about the background uh, of research. You mentioned the report uh, leading into the social economy sector, which is really interesting and I'll make sure that's available to the community. I guess uh, yeah, the other questions I had was one, what is the maybe most common type uh, of venture you're seeing engage with the centres? And what is the then awareness of sort of academics? How are they hearing about this? And um, what would sort of maybe help them get involved in some of the ventures themselves? Yeah. Um, so I think obviously through the Social Economy Academy, um, et cetera, and even through the LORIC project, like quite a high proportion, probably about 40, 50% of the organisations that we supported as part of that, which was more of a business support offer than an academic research offer. Um, they were social economy organisations. Um, I think, I don't know what the reasons for that were, whether they were just the word spread more around that sector that there was some fully funded support available. Um, and that's how we kind of attracted more in that kind of area. Um, and in terms of the background, our team, um, social science researchers, um, uh, would of, of various kind of backgrounds would, would be the, um, the main thing. So my, my background is psychology and mental health. Um, we've got people that have been involved in more criminology, um, business studies, um, the business and enterprise backgrounds, and um, sociology. Great, thanks so much. Um, and I think that covers those questions. As I said, we'll make sure that the report you mentioned is there and some links to go out uh, to the community. Um, but there's some really fantastic experience there. Uh, so thanks again for sharing that with us. Um, I believe the speakers for the Prince Prize in Scotland at Challenges are here. Um, so thanks again, Kay, really, really appreciate it. We'll move on now to hear about a sort of consortium that's helping universities uh, across Scotland currently, but I think further afield uh, over the next few years uh, to develop two. Um, so if the speakers for that section are ready to unmute, uh, then we'll carry on there. Hi, Arnie, can you hear me okay? Coming through great. Thanks so much, James. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, a real pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm sorry I can only join for a specific period of time. Um, I'm in an airport just now, so if you do hear some background noise, that's what it is. Um, Arnie, thanks for allowing me the chance to, to come today and, and speak. Um, my name is James Finney. I work for an organisation called... CEIS, Community Enterprise in Scotland, um, based in Glasgow, um, formed in 1984, but the UK's largest social enterprise development agency. Um, the reason why I'm at an airport today is I've just been at the Social Enterprise World Forum, and the global um, coming together of social entrepreneurs uh, in Amsterdam. Um, and really, from our perspective, um, our kind of journey in working with university started about four years ago. Um, where we started just to have that dialogue with universities to say, how do you consider social enterprise as a business model? Um, what is your kind of knowledge and understanding of social enterprise? And this is specifically in regards to as much as we had a dialogue in regards to student social enterprise, 
um, this was a dialogue specifically in regards to and um, those involved in research. Um, and the kind of feedback that came back to us at that point in time was that um, the knowledge of social enterprise was there, but maybe at, at different levels. Um, that uh, when I asked if there had been any social enterprise startups or spin outs, then there was maybe one example that came. Um, and um, from that perspective, um, what we then, from that day, we really started a journey in, in, over the last four years um, in, in working with um, the IP and commercialization and knowledge exchange teams within universities um, to really start to think about how social enterprise as a business model could be an option for researchers, um, as well as the traditional commercialization pathways that they were already in place. Uh, and really that kind of journey is, is developed. Um, and if it's possible, Arne, if I can share a slide, I don't, I should be able to slide share. And, and that developed into, into what we, um, I think there's some background noise. I'll just we go and mute this now while I share. Um, that developed into what we now see as a social enterprise runway um, for um, spin outs and, and also startups from academia um, that sits right alongside the existing commercialization runways that exist within the universities. Um, we went to the Scottish government and we said, we think that this is a real opportunity. Um, the Scottish government gave them some funding to go and, and, and support this. Um, and so far, um, we're now working with about seven uh, universities in Scotland, um, supporting academic spin-out and start-up. And the, the, it's not just my organisation at CIS. What we did was we brought in a number of different partners on the right-hand side there. Uh, you will see um, our organisation, CIS. You will see the Challenges Group, who are based in Edinburgh, one of Scotland's foremost um, social enterprises supporting internationalisation. Um, they've worked in about 70 different countries. They've got five offices in sub-Saharan Africa, for example. Um, so the challenges work very much alongside ourselves. Also Firstport, uh, which is Scotland's startup agency for social enterprise. Um, and also um, Mike Roberts Solicitors. And the reason why we brought um, an experienced legal firm um, to the table was because we knew that dialogues in regards to IP, dialogues in regards to structure, um, would be very much at the forefront of those dialogues and we needed to bring in some expert um, um, support to be able to navigate those discussions. And, and lastly, uh, Social Investment Scotland, um, Scotland's kind of foremost uh, social enterprise lender um, based in Edinburgh as well. And what that now allows us to do uh, is really offer uh, an integrated um, solution uh, and basically present that from the sector into the university as opposed to from the university out, and, and really allows us to sit alongside the commercialization stage gate processes that many universities have um, that allow um, those um, research opportunities to progress through the stage gate process. But we also basically support them through that process, working with the university teams. And what it then does at the end is, um, as they go through that process, the university um, still um, allows the stage game monies to be invested into the social enterprise or the potential social enterprise. And what it also allows us to then do is bring additional match funding to the table. So in the slide here, what you will see, um, the kind of services we provide, um, inquiry management on a one-to-one -one basis, um, really sitting no matter where, what stage the, the research is at or the opportunities are, we can come in as early as possible and understand what the things that need to happen to help that um, that piece of work progress into a potential um, um, uh, spin out or startup, we provide um, grant funding for the actual startup, the the company formation, for example, um, through as I said through Firstport. Um, we I think just last week um, made an award to um, a spin out coming out of a university in Scotland. So bringing additional funding, and that can be up to thirty thousand pounds worth of um, funding for initial startup and growth stage. Um, in addition to that, um, we've then got some further um, um, finance we can bring to the table. 
um, and that ranges from 30k to 1.3 million pounds, depending upon what the needs are and who the, the funder, um, who the partner is, is going to deliver that. So, for example, there's, there'll be a, a, a spin out happening from a Scottish university in November, and as much as they have secured the four, um, approximately forty thousand pounds of stage gate money from the university, um, we'll be making an investment. Um, which is a, a repayable social um, social investment uh, with patient terms of about £100,000 into that social enterprise spin out when it's formed as a, as a community interest company. Um, as I said, the legal support is also there, um, and that ranges from IP audits, advice, contractual matters, legal structures, company formation, and then the incubation and internationalisation. Um, the investment I just mentioned, about which is the hundred thousand pounds worth of investment coming in from actually a fund run by our colleagues in the challenges group, um, what that also does is allow them to to sit alongside um, the, the 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 startup or spin up, um, and really um, that period of of working with them is a prolonged period of up to five years, and really helping them to really you know get started, grow, and really develop and establish the organisation. And as I said, because of their international links, that again gives the applicability of that solution internationally. Um, the the experience that we've got to bring to the table to allow that to happen um, with teams in, as I said, up to five different countries, but experience in working over 70 countries. So collectively, um, we bring that package to the table um, and really um, work with the, the university teams to be able to um, you know, sit right beside them um, them and also the the the, the academic researcher uh, and what there's probably a couple of things worth mentioning um the last four years have involved quite a bit of dialogue in regards to um how social enterprise um model can integrate into the existing university and um, commercialization processes and some of the 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 thing some of the things that um have to be um evolved uh, to allow that to happen from a university policy perspective. Um, uh, and and secondly, um, f from uh, an academic's perspective, what we find, and also from a university's perspective, um, the social enterprise model seems to sit well with an, a lumber of researchers because of the reason why they start out in the first place. Um, and what we find is that in a number of occasions so far, um, of those that are actually going to progress to spin out or start up, um, we actually believe that those would not have progressed if they had remained within the university's commercialization um, runways. Um, and therefore, what we believe that social enterprise can do is broaden the entrepreneurial pool um, within the university infrastructure. So just now in the last um, kind of three and a half years, uh, we've probably been, had about 40 different, um, um, different inquiries that we've been working with. And by the end of this year, um, there'll be probably maybe about eight or nine that have actually went to company formation um, and at different stages of that. So um, hopefully, Arnie, that's a that's a quick um, kind of overview um, um, of what we do. Um, and, you know, really just wanted to come on and, and share that and see if that was helpful in your dialogues um, and if that resonated or not. What the next steps in our, in our um, process is um, to extend this to all 19 higher education institutions in Scotland um, and we're now in the dialogue with the Scottish Government about how we can do that. Excellent, thanks so much James, uh, what a fantastic insight into the work you're doing and the successes there that are already being seen. Uh, there's some really positive comments from some of the universities you've worked with coming through the chat as well so you can see that this is a system that is working, uh, engaging academics in the right way, finding the nuts and bolts development that's needed uh, and then making sure this can continue to grow uh, and be a success. How we then, you know, translate that back to the sector to make sure this is normalised uh, and then can start to scale up and different institutions can build collaborative platforms to get involved, I think is a big part of how we can grow this together as a community. So really great to have you uh, be a part and share that experience. I think there's a couple of uh, members of the teams and different organisations involved. If anyone from there wants to unmute uh, and add anything, absolutely feel free. But I did have um, one question, if you can still hear me, James, you've frozen a little bit, unless in case you've disappeared. Um, I can yeah, still hear you. Okay, great. 
The question I had was, is there any, it sounds like community interest company is very popular, which we found uh, in a few different places. That's very um, good option because it's flexible. It hits both sides of the financial sustainability and values of academics. But I guess the research type, are there any areas or maybe types of research or just, you know, disciplines that you're seeing maybe get involved in this first or lend itself to this? Um, and yeah, maybe with a view to future sort of themes, collaborations and stuff like that. What's the uh, the first successes you're seeing? Well, the Perfect. trends in the first successes. Um, the first one we did out of um, the University of Edinburgh was um, a community interest company that focused on um, biomolecular software um, and how that is utilised into the uh, design of, of, of drugs. Um, and um, one of the academics actually has since done a, a, a speech at the um, Research Software Engineers Conference last year in Newcastle and, and, and basically got up in front of his colleagues enthused about the kick model for 30 minutes um, because of what it allowed them to do as researchers that sometimes were difficult to do within just the traditional university structure. Um, so, you know, that was one example. That there'll be one coming out um, uh, uh, later this year um, from, um, it's a, a legal focus um, as well. So really from our perspective, Arne, um, you know, social enterprise is simply a business model. It's not a sector in itself. So it applies to, to all sectors. It's just a consideration of what the, and, and one of the things that, it's about balance here, about what the academic wants to achieve, but also what the university also wants to achieve from this and what role they play in it. So we're very, very uh, careful about that that dialogue um, so that, you know, all parties around the table actually get something from this. Excellent, excellent. So I said, maybe a minute or so for any of the chat or any of your team members to jump in if I want to add anything. Um, but yeah, maybe a final question from me would be what would help to develop capacity so this infrastructure can start to become more available to different universities? Is it the engagement? Is it the capacity in the departments? Or, you know, is it a start to talk about recognition and the sort of measures of success and metrics to go back into the sector? Yeah, you know, you know from our perspective, because this is a... Uh, uh... A Scottish government funded program and the Scottish government obviously wants to see and understand um, what the outputs are um, uh, and we believe we can demonstrate that even with the, the kind of the, the size of pool that we're working with just now um, but from a university perspective we understand that each university is at different stages it's got different capacities you know one of the things that we think this offers is it's a kind of plug and play for social enterprise startup or spin out that actually, from a university perspective, doesn't actually cost you guys anything. It just sits alongside your existing infrastructure, um, and and we work very closely. So I think there's a kind of win-win for everyone in that. Excellent, perfect. Uh, and following how that can develop uh, and become available to different institutions will be a really great part of the community as it rolls forward. So really, really appreciate uh, your contribution and sharing that experience with us. As I said, it's a really fantastic success uh, for us, and I think we'll lead on to a lot of what we do um, as a community anyway, especially as you're in transit to take the time to come and uh, share the experiences is really fantastic. So it was such a perfect session to hear from Matt. Uh, Thank to hear you, Annie. Experience in this. So thanks again, James. Um, and we'll I'll, I'll sign off now if that's okay, but if there's any follow-up through the chat or if anyone wants to contact me via email and you can share that, please. Great, yeah, I'll share details and we'll uh, make sure that the connections continue moving on. But thanks again, James. Thank uh, you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks. So, thanks. Uh, and then we'll move on to Cambridge Enterprise. We've got Emma Salgard Kuna, who can give um, some great experience about um, some projects that have been supported in the past um, and what that experience uh, tells us about capacity for institutions. Um, Emma, whenever you're ready, feel free to unmute and carry on. And thanks very much. Thanks, Annie. Um, I actually think that was like a kind of perfect run up into this because I think what I'm going to talk about is almost the experience on the other side. So um, coming into, a, so the University of Cambridge has got quite high capacity in technology transfer, coming into that and trying to bring social impact or arts, humanities and social science focused models to bear on something that's kind of already 
up and running and has its own momentum um, and trying to work out where there's space and gaps inside that institution to make a little bit of a wedge for our own projects. Um, so I'm also going to share um, some slides, as she says, hopefully. Uh, let's have a go at this. Can you see that? Yes, amazing. Let's see if I can actually move through the slides. Um, Perfect. So just a tiny introduction about um, Cambridge Enterprise. So Cambridge Enterprise is the commercialization arm of the University of Cambridge. So uh, we have about 100 staff um, in the House of Forum building, which is on the West Cambridge Innovation District. So about 10 minutes outside of the center of the university. Um, and there's sort of four main things, I guess, that we do at Cambridge Enterprise. So the first is that we have a consultancy services team. So if academics um, have developed business relationships or links um, with outside institutions or organizations or with industry, and there's a possibility of something that's starting to look less like research and more like kind of service delivery, then we have a team who can kind of help with the contracting and all the practicalities of that, um, just to take that kind of burden off the researchers. Then we have a technology development and licensing team, um, and that's where I sit. So this is a research service, much like any other TTO, um, will take new projects, new disclosures that are coming in, um, out of research. So the researchers have got some kind of amazing innovation moment, had a light bulb, um, come to us, told us their idea, and then we'll try and walk them through the next uh, process, however many years that might take towards working out if there's a business model, seeing if it's viable, thinking about what the intellectual property might be, if there, if there is any that needs um, protecting, and then popping it out the other side, hopefully as a successful license, whether into um, an existing company or via a spin out route. Um, we're also really lucky to have an internal seed funds team. So we have a small investment fund um, that's managed um, internally to Cambridge Enterprise. That means that we can put um, first bits of funding into our companies. Um, and we do that especially in syndicate. So we look to try and fund to bring other investors um, on board. And then the last um, thing that Cambridge Enterprise is, I suppose, is a platform. So we have um, a program called IE Cambridge Innovation and Entrepreneurship Cambridge, um, which looks to attempt to bring some kind of uh, convening piece to the very crazy um, and extremely active entrepreneurial ecosystem around the university that there are kind of hubs and places that people can come to get their first introduction and understand where are all the different accelerators um, you know what are the different kinds of support services that the university might be able to, to provide so we try and serve the best we can as a front door um, to navigate people into that system so that's um, kind of Cambridge Enterprise in a bit of a nutshell so I arrived in Cambridge Enterprise in um, 2018 and um, I knew absolutely nothing about technology transfer so I was coming from an arts and humanities sort of knowledge exchange and social entrepreneurship background um, I knew that this building exists because there's a cafe on the ground floor where I used to breastfeed my kid in between supervising undergraduates as a unstable early career researcher and um, so I knew this building um, but I had absolutely no idea what was going on inside it so I was kind of surprised to see the uh, job description for somebody to scope out arts, arts humanities and social science commercialization um, and I think it was pretty clear to me from that job description um, that nobody who had written the job description had any idea what the arts humanities and social sciences looked like um, so Oh, there was already a little bit of a chasm to cross, but I think it, it was a different situation to perhaps quite a lot of um, other universities or other sort of, I don't know, other cultures where I'd been working where there was a sort of building from the ground up piece because there was already this existing very, very strong mechanism that was kind of operating, I don't know, like a well-oiled machine to, to create STEM-based um, high impact kind of high scale um, spin outs and licenses. And then this was a kind of new thing that we were gonna try and integrate and pull into the, into the rest of the piece. And so what I thought I would sort of try and talk about all the way, I perhaps try and frame what I'm gonna say now is that I think looking back, there have kind of been three pieces to that. So I was brought in to do some scoping work. Scoping work is is nice. It feels um, absolutely distant. You're in listening mode. You know, you don't have to make promises. You just make suggestions and the whiteboards are out. Um, and I was very comfortable in that mode. But what happened 
really, really rapidly was that um, I uncovered projects that actually needed support like immediately. Um, and they were so happy that somebody was asking them um, or so happy that somebody was suggesting that social innovation might be a part of the role of the technology transfer office um, that quite quickly uh, I was overwhelmed <laughs> by new projects that I really didn't understand how to support. But we had this kind of commitment and idea that, yes, we were going to start supporting these projects. So we're sort of continuing to scope and then now also bringing up um, a kind of group of new, interesting projects, mostly with a social science focus, where the academics actually, and sometimes, sometimes these were quite mature projects, the academics were already delivering interventions. They were well outside of what the research office considered to be research, but they were doing it with no, no help. Or even worse, they were doing it um, against you know with active kind of um uh barriers being set up for them to do it so so suddenly we had this kind of responsibility for this new set of projects and then the next two to three years was really about understanding the needs of those um of those researchers but actually i think what became clear to me quite quickly was that this was going to be much more about changing the culture and the processes of the commercialization office, right? The academics are not a problem that needs to be fixed. The researchers knew what they were trying to do and they were doing it very effectively, um, despite everything. Um, the, the difficulties were actually in the existing system. And one thing that became apparent to me as well was that I didn't understand the system. You know, I didn't understand technology transfer enough to be able to make sensible suggestions and to understand where the things I thought were very, very unique and special about my researchers actually were unique and special. And where in fact, these were actually problems that were known within the commercialization office and that the solutions that we might build would be solutions that would be relevant to all of the research community. And so now I think the focus of the last six months to a year has been around mainstreaming arts, humanities and social science report, uh, support and mainstreaming social impact support within the TTO. So everywhere that you see talk of spin outs, there is now talk of spin outs, including social ventures. And every time that a new idea comes into the TTO, they're being offered the idea that there might be a social innovation model that would work for this. Perhaps there are charitable, par charitable partners as well as industry partners. Perhaps we should be thinking about impact investors or even philanthropy for getting this uh, project out of the um, out of the office. And that's a, you know that's a long change, and and we're not there yet. We're mainstreaming. We're not yet mainstream, but I think. Although there will we will continue to need to go back round this circle again and again as new projects come through the door and we kind of identify new problems and needs, the focus is much more on how will the work that is happening in arts, humanities and social science commercialization actually bring solutions that can cross the whole of the research community and that are shared by STEM. And I absolutely love what James just said, that social enterprise is a business model, not a sector. Um, so, you know, this is not something that is exclusive to social scientists. This is something that is going to be relevant in the life sciences. It's going to be relevant in the physical sciences. It's going to be relevant to software plays. And we see that more and more. So um, I said to Arnie that I would um, give a couple of case studies and, and see if that's helpful. I'm not going to spend too long on these, but this slide, I'm sorry if anybody has seen this before because I like wheel it out anytime I'm speaking, but this is the, I'm very happy with this slide because I think we've kind of got to the point where we can actually segment a little bit the projects that are in the portfolio. So we've seen about 300 new disclosures come into Cambridge Enterprise um, over the last um, five or six years. And at the beginning, we had no idea which of these were good and which of these were bad. We had no indicators. We had nothing that would help us to know what was going to fly and what was actually a project that, that should never have been in the commercialization um, portfolio and needed a different kind of support. But I think we're at the point now where we're kind of able to slice and dice. Um, and so these are the four ways that I think about the projects in the portfolio. And I'll give a, a little example of each. So the first is research tools. So as social scientists, we develop methods, we develop tools, we develop data sets and ways of communicating our research to the outside world. So that's why we see the proliferation of toolkits, um, for example, as research outputs from uh, the work that's supported by ESRC. So these research tools have applications for other researchers 
um, in academia, but they may also have applications for researchers or people sitting in R&D functions um, outside of the academic. Um, and so uh, research tools is something that I see lots of. Um, and this example, I think, is a kind of interesting one. So this little pink um, picture at the top on the left um, is from Discovery. So Discovery is a tool that was developed in our Department of Public Health. Um, and it's basically a consultation tool, but a really nice consultation tool for people um, who are um, wanting to make improvements to the healthcare system or social care system. So rather than send out a survey to um, the last 200 mothers who have been through your maternity hospital um, and they will never fill that survey out um, they're not in the state of mind to fill a survey out, they don't want to fill a survey out. Instead, you invite them into um, a community, um, an online digital community, which is very, very easy and intuitive and it's designed for them. Um, it's designed to be highly accessible um, and it allows them to um, record small impressions, um, to uh, give longer feedback, to share their experience with researchers who are sitting on the other side and understanding and sort of gathering that data and information in order to make recommendations for change inside a system. Um, and the great thing about discovery when it came to us, it was already in use by lots and lots of different research teams but we had the possibility that now this could actually be taken and used directly in the NHS or directly by policymakers um, in government. Um, so this came in then almost as a kind of consultancy project. So we were able to deliver a few consultancy contracts, but actually there was also a recognition that this needed to get bigger, it needed to scale, um, and that we also needed to have a really secure software system that was sitting outside of the university that had the capacity to actually interface with, you know, NHS systems, for example. Um, and so we decided that we would uh, create a spin out. Um, and that was a long and hard process. Um, but this is now a social enterprise spin out. There is a charitable foundation that hold um, some equity in the company in trust um, and then a company um, limited by shares. So a scaling company limited by shares, but funded entirely by charitable investment. Um, so this is the vehicle that's uh, spun out of the university in the last year. The next slice is a little bit more straightforward, I think. So this is content. We see a lot of um, media. We see a lot of educational courses, resources and materials, handbooks, um, and also uh, games, video games. And this uh, little image is from a video game called um, Dish Life, which was developed by a group of sociologists. Um, it allows, uh, the idea originally was to encourage young people, especially young women, to think about careers in STEM and to recognize that their um, caring and interpersonal skills were as valuable in the STEM world as their kind of uh, unique individual genius, um, that sort of uh, stereotype of what a, a, a good scientist might look like. Um, and they developed this absolutely beautiful Wellcome Trust funded um, video game concept, which was then picked up um, by a game developer and is now available for free download. Um, so if you have small children, uh, encourage them to download um, Dish Life and while away hours playing the life of a scientist and keeping your scientific community operational, making sure that you send your graduate students home so that they can have a nap. Um, otherwise the quality of their scientific work will go down. And you also encounter lots of different different kind of moral questions um, about biases and, and difficulties in science that would allow you to understand this, this kind of social dynamics of the lab. The third slice is deep technologies. So um, in Cambridge, at least, we have a strong technical base and that extends across the arts, humanities and social science researchers as well. Um, and so for us, the deep tech tends to be software. Um, so we have very exciting software tools, especially in AI, machine learning, natural language processing that can be developed um, either into high value licenses that go straight into industry or into spin outs such as this spin out, which is called um, the Regulatory Genome Project or Reg Genome. This is an attempt to create a financial DNA structure. Um, so a computational way of understanding the difference between financial regulatory systems that can be employed by financial service companies. And this is a big spin out um, that aims to uh, service and capture the market of lots and lots of different financial providers um, globally and to make uh, a kind of pain point for them disappear, which is how do they make sure that they are, um, are keeping abreast of regulatory change across lots and lots of different international jurisdictions. Um, and then the last bucket, social interventions. 
Um, so this uh, particular intervention is called IC Thinking. Um, it is a, um, an intervention that came out about the same time as the kind of prevent agenda was appearing. And it's essentially an attempt to get two different sides of a community into productive conversation and to recognize that there isn't a black and white, um, but actually that a little bit of grayscale thinking can find common ground between communities. So this is an intervention that's usually delivered by local service providers. So it could be NGOs or local councils. Um, and it's a, a method which which is um, trademarked and has a certain amount of rigor to it um, that allow, that's sort of um, transposable into different contexts again and again. IC Thinking is a social enterprise. Um, it provides training so that people can learn how to facilitate this method. And it also provides a sort of consultancy or a service to come in and actually deliver this in different contexts. So those are the kinds of projects that we see um, across the breast. I'm not going to speak for very much longer, which you'll probably be glad about. Um, but I wanted to end with um, this slide, um, not because the content is particularly relevant to you guys right now, but because it's an example, I hope, of this idea of mainstreaming. So taking all of those projects in, um, and we have about 35 new projects or something like that that comes in every year, we've slowly been trying to adapt and tailor the communication of the whole of Cambridge Enterprise to better reflect the idea that commercialization is a pathway to impact amongst a whole different bunch of pathways that researchers might already be aware of. Um, if anybody's heard Julian Janker, who's now over at ARC speak, he speaks really strongly on this, and it's something that we've really tried to take on board. Um, so this slide is a very preliminary slide that exists in um, our outreach decks that go out to the university in any discipline. So this is not an arts, humanities and social science specific slide. It's at the front of, you know, our software presentations, our physical sciences presentations. And it basically says commercialization is a route to impact alongside all of these others, which you might already be engaged in. You're teaching your students. Your priority might be public engagement. Your priority might be to to work with the arts. Your priority might be to get your advocacy message out through uh, media outlets. All of those things are complementary. And in some cases, you may also need to produce a product or a service or have a business model, essentially, in order to sustain that impact. And that's where commercialization comes in. So rather than imagining commercialization as this like super unique stream, it is exciting because it, it promises scale and um, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, I don't know there's a lot of joy to um, being in that kind of inventive entrepreneurial space. Um, but this is something that should be building on and should be complementary to all of the other knowledge exchange support services that exist inside the university system. Um, and I think as a foundation for the work of the entire technology and licensing um, and development team, rather than as just a specific AHSS message. This has got um, a really, I think, strong, interesting future because I absolutely agree with previous speakers. We are getting the mandate to deliver social innovation projects, not just from the arts, humanities and social sciences, but from every single discipline and increasingly from researchers who have a red line around needing to create something that is absolutely impact focused first. So how are we going to respond and build the platforms that will allow them to do that? And I really hope that arts, humanities and social sciences is going to be one of the kind of leaders um, for doing that. I'll stop there. I hope I was within a reasonable time limit there, Arnie. <laughs> That was excellent. Thanks so much, Emma. What an incredible breakdown of the sort of situation right now and uh, solutions to do it both understanding the projects themselves, getting the nuts and bolts systems within TTOs uh, and KE to understand this, uh, and then give that wider understanding of commercialization, but that will hopefully evolve uh, as we get different. Uh, sort of research types and then venture types being supported through these systems. Uh, we'll just give a, a second or two for any questions in the chat because uh, that was a really, really uh, interesting contribution. I guess one question I had though was as you've engaged with the more sort of conventional forms of commercialization that have been limited company STEM kind of systems uh, and then started to introduce either social ventures or discipline specific commercialization for arts, commercialization and social science. Uh, bearing in mind in a lot of institutions, it's going to be the same team that have been doing it for years and years and now being told to understand these two things. What, uh, I guess, was the biggest barrier you found? Was it understanding the nature of what's coming out of the research and how you would self-sustain some impact from that? 
or was it the understanding of organization types and a more diverse form of commercialization and forms you've talked about there and managed to uh, develop? Yeah, so in terms of like finding new models, um, it's always hard, right? But I mean, all technology transfer requires tailored models. There isn't like a sausage factory for commercialization of, you know, drug discovery projects or something. So, I mean, there's always a little bit of creativity. But one thing that's been amazing is that actually the amount of sharing between different institutions that are working in arts, humanities and social science commercialization has meant that, okay, I might not have a case study that looks like this, but I'm pretty sure that I can pick up the phone and find somebody who has seen something like this before. And especially in this social enterprise world, people are so willing to share. It's, it's, it's amazing. Academics who've done this work before, very generous, they will come, they will speak to other academics, other TTO staff have got models that are working for them and are willing to share. So that has been really, really helpful. And we reached out to a couple of local incubators and accelerators in Cambridge who were doing social enterprise work. So one is called Alia and they've been um, part of this series as well recently. And the other is called Cambridge Social Ventures and that is a, um, a kind of philanthropically funded social venture incubator. It's open to anybody. So if you have social ventures, you should check out Cambridge Social Ventures. And again, they were willing to share mentors networks, come and speak to us. So there's just kind of excitement and welcoming about exploring these new models. So that was not so much of a barrier. I think one thing, like I said, one thing that was really difficult was just actually understanding what the tools available were. So until you've taken a case right the way through, and it can take like four or five years in some cases to bring an impact case through to actual spin out, you know, you're kind of discovering the possibilities and the limitations of your tools like licenses um, for example different kind of investment vehicles as you go um, and so it's taken a really long time for me to start to like shake off imposter syndrome and feel like no it's okay I understand technology transfer more or less and you know I can apply the principles of technology transfer and I can see where there's possibilities but the the, the difficult piece has been more around um, even though Cambridge Enterprise is full of extremely smart people who are absolutely committed to societal impact from commercialization, I think with arts, humanities and social sciences, it's been easy for people to be like, we love that you guys are doing this, That's, but it's kind of nothing to do with us. So like, have fun over there um, and we'll carry on doing our thing. And so actually bringing projects through and speaking about them and making sure that people across the TTO are involved directly in these projects has been absolutely crucial. This isn't something that we can do in isolation in a separate strand, because otherwise, even if people are like ideologically committed to doing this, it doesn't mean anything because they don't need to get their hands dirty with it. Um, and so, you know, asking questions like, well, how are you already capturing the impact of the work that you're doing in STEM technology transfer, for example, you know, getting people to really engage with those questions and say, this is not something that I'm going to think about by myself. Everybody needs to think about this. I think that is ongoing work. Um, but it hasn't much been about the hearts and minds of the academics, I would say, which is probably where I imagine the problems would arise in the beginning. Excellent. Great. Again, fantastic. Um prompts to this conversation about the nuts and bolts systems here. Um, developing these new diverse routes for the systems that exist in students already. There's a couple of last questions, if you don't mind just uh, talking to them. One of them is a little bit about what you started talking about there, the team. What does that look like? Is that changing now that these successes are being able to be shouted about? And is that yeah. sort of collaboration working? And then there's a couple of questions on the sort of finances or academics. You've mentioned a lot of um, energy from academics from the start. Uh, is that because they are purely saying, hey, social value is purely charitable, or do they have an understanding of the need for at least covering uh, their own costs or maybe bring some back into research at the university? Uh, and then are you seeing that, seeing that success from these project types uh, that you've given great examples of? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, great. So the team structure. So for a long time, it was just me. Um, when the ESRC launched the um, the cross work, that allowed us to bring another person, a dedicated person in around arts, humanities and social science. And that was really to think about like kind of our programming and structuring of support and also to do some more consultation and evaluation work and, and also just to experiment a little bit in a way that I hadn't 
I sort of described before, I got a bit overwhelmed. I really was kind of drowning under the projects coming in. And so it was almost like I needed to stop asking for any more <laughs> any more feedback, which we didn't want to do because we don't want to stall the thing. But, you know, we kind of need to build the capacity at the same time. So that was really, really instrumental. And so now we have um, a team of two people that are specifically working on cases. We also have somebody who's specifically working on social investment. Um, so advising companies around um, seeking social investment and also looking at our internal processes. So we have our own investment fund. We do have the capacity to invest into social ventures, but actually um, the kind of instrument that we're using is probably not appropriate. We're aware it's appropriate for some, but not for all. And so there are a large number of companies that we can't help with funding. So trying to understand and look at that. So that's three of us. And then we matrix in a huge amount of support from the physical sciences and life sciences teams as well. So we'll bring people over to help us on individual cases, especially as they reach um, the kind of crucial spin out or crucial license moment. And that's very helpful. That I mean, that's helpful for also getting the message about AHSS back out into the institution. Um, the question about saying people saying they want to give things away for free. Um, this is especially, I think, in cases where people have been very used to using um, like kind of open source models or they're really committed to open innovation communities. And that's absolutely fine. Um, and we can sometimes um, help them to give things away for free uh, better <laughs> by thinking about like, OK, well, what kind of risks are there here, etc. But the kind of key message that I try and send to those people is like no white elephants. So if you as a research community have the capacity to keep this tool available for free and actually for people to be able to find it and it's not going to disappear and it's not the links are not going to break that's amazing do that you know because commercialization is really hard but if you're going to produce a white elephant if you're going to take grant funding and produce something and put it onto a university web page and then all the postdocs on that project will leave and you will move on to a new project and it just sits there and it's not accessed by anybody because nobody really knows it's there anymore and there isn't a partner who's out there instrumentally using it then that's not a good outcome in my opinion you know that's not what we want to do with this kind of research output and I think that generally that rings true for the academics that have sought help from the commercialization office that's it. they don't want to end up in a situation where they create amazing research and then they publish it and that's and only people that they already kind of know read it like that's not an outcome for them so we're trying to avoid that white elephant at all times but that doesn't mean that we can't give things away for free or work charitably if we if that is the best route to impact we just have to think about whether or not it really is going to provide sustainability um, and then in terms of uh, income generation, you guys are probably aware that Cambridge has a bit of a weird IP policy. So we do not own the intellectual property of our um, academics. And that means that academics work voluntarily with us. And if they want to work with the um, commercialization office, then we will generally try and take an equity stake in a company, a small and dilutable equity stake in a company. Um, at the moment, I can't tell you that any of the arts, humanities and social science spin outs are generating any income for the university, probably a little bit, but not very much. But uh, they are scaling. They're only two or three years in at this point. Um, and I would expect that if these companies are bought, um, they are now very valuable companies, especially the software companies. And I would expect that the university and the individual academics, whether they've gone with the company or been left behind, will see income from that. But spin out companies is not our main focus. Um, so we also have a licensing business um, and licenses do bring a small amount of income back into the university. And that's hugely helpful for keeping sustainable models on the road for further research impact work happening um, in the individual departments. So, yes, we do create income for the university through our commercialization activity already. Thanks so much. Uh, maybe for time, maybe start to move on to the next speaker. Now, there is a couple of cool questions that leads to what a hopefully the conversations in this session anyway about what are the nuts and bolts processes we start to set up and what makes that appropriate to each institution. Um, thanks so much Emma again for such a great uh, contribution, really really interesting to hear about uh, developing that capacity especially uh, going alongside existing commercialization systems. Um, we'll also bearing in mind have future sessions about metrics so when um, the projects that are getting commercialized are maybe only covering their own costs, which does sometimes happen. How do we still communicate that success uh, in a way that keeps the sector happy and sort of mitigates the worry about risk 
because we could tie it to other missions, initiatives, uh, metric success around impact or civic engagement, things like that. Um, so that'll be a great conversation to continue within the community. Um, but yeah, if just for title, we can move on to Tom Williamson, who, as I said, is currently doing a PhD at UWE, uh, University mm -hmm. of West England, but has uh, connections to a few different institutions and has done some great work understanding the changing nature of commercialization in universities. Um, so yeah, whenever you're ready, Tom, feel free to carry on. Great, thanks for the intro. And uh, thanks to all the previous speakers as well. I found this really, really interesting. Um, so hello, my name's Tom. Uh, I think I'll give you a bit of introduction to myself first and then try to give you the end of what I would like to talk about second, and then maybe give a bit more of a spiel. I won't take up as much time as other speakers, so there's plenty of question, time to ask questions to other speakers if you didn't get your question answered as much as, as, as me, if you like. So um, like Arnie said, my name's Tom. Uh, I'm mostly based in Bristol between the University of the West of England and Southmead Hospital, where I do a PhD mixing linguistics and neurosurgery. My PhD involves designing language tests for weight craniotomies. Um, I'm also a part-time consultant at PSI, who are an international psychometrics testing company, and I work for their um, English proficiency testing department. And I'm also based at Oxford and the University of Southern California. At Oxford, I work on a project investigating um, the involvement of syntactic operations in language on our cognition and at USC I work with uh, colleagues at um, UC Berkeley and Google to understand how colorblind people process color metaphors. Now why does that have any relation to, to commercialization? Well it doesn't necessarily but I have um, an academic leaning mind and my experience working with research and with the, the, the commercialization of uh, linguistics research namely via um, English proficiency testing, which is a representative of a discipline in linguistics called applied linguistics or language testing, has um, given me like a, a range of, of experiences that I've hopefully um, combined into sort of a useful platform for thinking about this issue. And I am currently sort of also trying to research research commercialization itself uh, a little bit on the side. And that's how Arnie found me, found me through my research, and, and that's why I'm, I'm here today. So the the end of my talk, the end of what I would like to talk to you about, um, simply is the idea that I think um, academic departments should employ business development staff that are subject specific to assist in the discovery and realization of commercial opportunities within that department. Uh, you might call them, um, you know, academic business development style or something that's that's the simple idea uh now you can switch off now if you like and not listen to anything else i say but if you'd like to listen um i'm going to try and frame that suggestion with a bit more depth and then any scrutiny is more than welcome so uh i also haven't got any slides so you're gonna have to look at my face unfortunately uh the, the start of this piece is essentially my suggestion that research commercialization in my opinion, is a seriously underexploited opportunity. I think people in this call um, understand the value of commercialization. I think my suggestion is that um, for general revenue gain at universities, uh, given con current context, uh, research commercialization could be, uh, well, I, I think, yeah, seriously represents a, a, an underexploited opportunity. And to, to give some specific context to this, I'm sure people are, you know, at least vaguely familiar with some of these kinds of statistics. I mean, for example, HESA reporting last year that 95% of all university income came from tuition fees, that many of the uh, top universities in the UK, and specifically UCL, Imperial, LSE, um, Edinburgh, Glasgow, they all receive double the tuition fee income from non-UK students compared to UK students in the same year that I just mentioned. Um, and so we have one major source of income, right, for, for universities, but there's not one major output. The other important output, especially from the perspective of academics, is, is their own research. Uh, and trying to leverage that to, to diversify the business model of universities more generally, as opposed to uh, the, the common uh, 
rhetoric being espoused with regards to uh, student recruitment being diversifying international student recruitment, which basically means, you know, more countries or whatever. Uh, I think that could be a, a more fruitful endeavor, in my opinion. You know, uh, One core component of, of, uh, of achieving such an idea, I think, is trying to develop existing and, and perhaps coming up with a few new kinds of within university infrastructure. And that would be hopefully to leverage uh, researchers' academic ideas, as we've been talking about a lot in this call already, uh, where you know they may have a commercial opportunity they um, they want to they want to exploit. Uh, but specifically, I think there's an angle to this where one might also want to leverage the the academic ideas that researchers have that they might they themselves may not have foreseen. And that's where the idea of a, you know, a departmental business development person might come in. I think developing existing within university infrastructure would also be important for trying to bring together different kinds of department at universities. Now, I think this is more difficult to achieve at different kinds of institution and different sizes of institution. But plenty of universities have existing manufacturing and, and resource uh, uh, you know, you know, technology uh, departments and and you know ones that are set up to teach engineers, for example, and uh, you know staff that have expertise in all kinds of manufacturing, engineering, software, electrical, mechanical, etc. Um, trying to leverage their skills in, in that same way to to, to promote uh, the development of internal commercialization ideas and opportunities I think would be an interesting idea um so I think there are a lot of different routes to try to achieve uh, expanding commercialization and make it more of a like a higher profile uh piece for, for universities in terms of their, their their business model and I think as I've mentioned several times already and and explained at the start I think recruiting academic department level, subject matter expert business development staff is one of the uh one of the keys perhaps to making this a success and as a bit of context perhaps uh my reading of the situation to date has been and i and you know, please correct me if this is wrong but it seems as if um the model involves universities sort of expecting academics across all disciplines to be sufficiently entrepreneurial to come up with a commercial idea for help develop for helping them to develop it um and certainly the academics that i know not all of them um not necessarily always entrepreneurial entrepreneurially minded now we've already heard in this call about academics wishing to you know for example give things away for free and that's not the same as necessarily being entrepreneurial but um i i would only uh uh suggest essentially that i think staff of a similar kind to those perhaps working in already in university international departments at universities you know in other words staff that who use their passion for education and their expertise uh, in in sales to promote the university to international students could also be working within academic departments to try to promote their um academics research now let me expand on that a little bit more um so these people could perhaps even be departmental alumni those who are already familiar with the staff perhaps even friendly with them uh, familiar with the research being conducted but perhaps like i mentioned have that sort of entrepreneurial entrepreneurially minded focus their goal i think would be to firstly work collaboratively with academics to identify the roots of their ideas and as a consequence of that, the potential commercial opportunities from within the research. Um, the role would also involve developing business proposals, including how to link up with existing university infrastructure, like I've already mentioned, as well as the wider world of industry and society. So hopefully having or, or being able to work with other, for example, commercialization or, or knowledge transfer departments within universities to link to the wider world of industry and society as well as trying to obviously determine the, the costings and perhaps in some cases the feasibility of, of giving things away for free. And I think also 
the role of these people would be advocating on their department's behalf to central university leadership for such commercial opportunities. You can imagine a, a kind of bidding system where departmental uh, business development staff have to come up with proposals to submit to some sort of central body, be that depending on perhaps the, the size and kind of university, a commercialization department or, or senior university leadership. Um, and trying to, to to advocate for their department within that sort of setting. So bring that all to a close, uh, why would I suggest that this is a, a useful or important endeavor? Like I've mentioned, I think diversifying the sources of income for universities is possibly quite important, especially given the, the wider political and, and, and geopolitical context that universities currently find themselves in, uh, trying to strengthen the university business model and, and as a consequence, um, becoming research-led as much as teaching-led with respect to financial priorities for, for university management. I think that could be really important for trying to secure the sector. Uh, I think this could also help to uh, further the existing university mission of being recognised as centres for expertise within within the markets, not just within teaching. I think if different universities had different specialisms with respect to the kinds of outputs commercially that their academics are able to produce I think that would be really good on a, from a reputational perspective and perhaps uh, generically perhaps um, this is a bit of a wishy-washy point but I think it's still quite important is that you know with access to to more resources that commercial gains might end up generating that could end up empowering more world-leading discovery and making society and the world a better place. So that's that's everything from me. Uh, I'd like to thank Arnie for the opportunity to come and speak and thank you all for listening. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tom. Some really interesting points there and it touches on a few different themes that are really, really relevant to this conversation, both for nuts and bolts capacity uh, of how to really make it feasible that research thinks about these options uh, and then can actually be developed in that way. But then the cultural aspect as well. How is it understood and recognised as part of academic business? Um, outward facing culture, how are we seen as institutions within society uh, and our place within that, which is a really, really important one. Um, see your comments just come in. Um, resource. Great. Yeah, some of a, a really great comment on uh, what it would mean to start developing this capacity in departments. Uh, so that's really appreciated. Um, just because of time, we've run over a little bit, uh, expected for speakers, I'm going to launch the polls, which are a really important part of this session, because we will develop more sort of dedicated either training or policies to advocate for, um, to try and develop this capacity. Uh, so just to hear what people are thinking of in that area, I'm just going to fire off something, but please do feel free to carry on uh, commenting and chatting. But if you could just take a minute to answer a couple of these questions, uh, that will lead on to further um, thoughts. I guess, um, Tom, one quick question about your idea would be, how would you ensure that the business development within the academic side links to the capacity that exists already for tech transfer and commercialization and that different forms of venture development uh, and building uh, and that capacity reaches across sort of different departments. Um, would you see them linked uh, as roles or would you see it as more um, as a translation in itself to make sure that the expertise of that academic knowledge is then linked to the TTOs and the KEs? Yeah, that's an interesting point because what you're essentially trying to balance is uh expertise of two kinds right it's subject matter expertise and then it's knowledge transfer and, and commercialization expertise um i think it would depend on the institution which one they would want to prefer for the specific roles given um given their needs and and um the size of the institution as well perhaps it could very well be that you have um individuals based within a, a tech transfer or knowledge exchange commercialization department who have um uh like specializations perhaps and well, this person works for this one as much as, as much as that one, and they're often in the academic department, but perhaps not necessarily based in it. So I think it would just it would just depend. Great, great. And these conversations will continue, so really, really appreciate that. Just remind everyone the poll is now open, so if you could please just take a minute or two to let me know your thoughts about 
where the current barriers and opportunities are in infrastructural capacity, then that will really, really help us to develop insights and things to move on community from. Is everyone seeing the poll? Is the questions uh, visible? Are people able to respond to So I'm not getting any responses on the poll. Can someone just let me know that uh, it has actually launched? Um, that you can... I saw it launch and answered. On, I so saw it launch and answered as yeah, well. Same here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Same, same here, same Ronnie. Here. Yeah, uh -huh. everyone's here. They are filling it in. That's interesting. Uh, I'm sure, hope the results will come up after. Usually it comes up live. So I've got no idea what people are saying is their most important areas in this. But I really appreciate you taking my time to give the answers. Uh, but I'll see you again in a minute. Okay, so just finished the session then. Reminder, next week's actually on Monday, Matt will finish this initial series of uh, workshops to launch community. Uh, it's been really, really great to have such a fantastic range of speakers give some really great expertise um, and to see so many people get engaged um, and enjoy the conversations. It's been a fantastic way to launch a community. Um, really, really great to start getting to know everybody that's um, involved uh, and motivated to be a part. Uh, on Monday will be a little bit shorter. We'll take the sort of discussion part out of this session because Monday will, as I said, have a great couple of um, speakers about commercialising policy, which is a you know a thing that comes up in this area quite a lot. Uh, academics either say, "Oh, I don't ever want to make any money," or they either say, "This is a policy project, so um, not right to commercialise it." But uh, we'll be proving them wrong and create a showing how that's worked in different places already. But then we'll move on to um, a little bit of governance about the community because uh, there's a couple of things that are going to branch out of the sessions now that these sort of initial workshops are going to run. We will have another series in January, which are going to slightly more granular questions about metrics and how to sort of um, understand the changing nature of policies and funding in this area and then how to maybe think about metrics of success that meet both sides of institutional needs and the academics values um but around that we'll have um some more dedicated sort of network sessions so we've already from our insights so far had uh, a sort of popularity with community interest companies and accrediting limited companies so we'll maybe have slightly more practical run through of what that takes uh, to build those um and already starting to see a few different bits uh, about the way to bridge with different organizations outside of universities that will either have capacity to help develop ventures or maybe just the expertise of the venture building or ideally funding which is obviously a big thing for everybody so we'll have some sessions there we'll also have sessions that will start to define collaborations um, which will be around either regionally um, so as Emma said there's some really great um, energy in the sector to share what works and the sort of best practice and things like that so how do we do that in either an area where certain local authority partners charities funders in that region might uh, be ready and can sort of uh, consolidate how universities link to them or around research themes and types so as we said um, especially with community enterprise in Scotland have a great conversation about this already and could maybe start to introduce that uh, into what the community plugs into is seeing global challenges, either areas of research um, or research of output types, um, and then starting to create platforms that can collect those across different institutions as well. Um, so that the sort of end goal of where, of where this research can be applied, uh, and there's gonna be money then to allow that application to sustain itself, uh, can sit uh, outside in the real world, which is building the bridges we've mentioned in a few ways. I'm gonna end the poll now. Hopefully that comes up with some answers. Great, great, I can see that, fantastic. Um, so yeah, as I said, we'll end up this, uh, this one here uh, and have a bit of a more wider community discussion on Monday after commercializing policy session, but would just like to take a minute again to thank all the speakers. We've had some really, really fantastic contributions there. And we've touched on some of the really, really important parts of this conversation, both um, the capacity in itself in universities, what exists already, how to make STEM and sort of VC limited company commercialization, start to understand this, um, and the knowledge that exists within these departments, what those departments might look like in the future. And then that bigger conversation of understanding how 
universities as a concept a player in society how is that going to evolve over the next few years so that this very applied practical development of research to create social impact that can sustain itself uh, and be a source for good uh, with all capacity we have uh, can be in the future so thanks again everybody stay tuned for some updates Thank you.